So, Bismillah alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Muhammadin al-Amin amma ba'd. Fa'awud billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa ashiruhunna bil-ma'roof. Bismillah. Okay. Wa ashiruhunna bil ma'roof. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Ameen ya Rabbi. Let me see if I can leave this here or leave this around this. Let's see how this works. <coughs> So, Bismillah. So, um, today we're going to uh, complicate things a little bit, not too much. If everybody remembers, uh, in the first class, we talked about bidding, right? So, bidding is a request. So, this is like the basic interaction between a husband and wife. So, there is bidding or there is a transaction, a request. And a person either accepts the request or doesn't accept the request. And we were talking about this for the last few weeks. Today, we're going to add um, a little bit of a new dimension to this. Um, so what happens with these requests? Um, we're going to look at it from a different perspective. Now, <clears throat> because I have Brother Yunus here, I have to add a note of caution uh, that would be necessary for any professor teaching at Harvard University. Uh, and that is that all maps lie. So that is not to say any one map is going to give you the whole picture. Uh, all maps lie, Brother Eunice. Okay. So no, no one map can give you a full picture. But every map gives you some of the picture. So uh, today we're going to talk about transactional functional ego state model. Um, so what is that? Look, there's a husband, there's a wife. Husband says, can we do this? The wife is going to respond. Yes, we can or we can't. But we generally, the response will fall into three different categories. And that's what we're going to understand is that so that we can go back and look at ourselves a little bit more critically that how in what state do I respond to the people or in what state am I responding to my spouse? And these are pretty typical. And when I will tell you, when I first studied this, I wasn't very impressed. I was like, oh, this is just same Freudian type nonsense, even though Freud said a lot of great things. I mean, he came very close to the idea of the ruh, the, the, uh, the, the, I mean, for, for Freud, ego is a different meaning. It's actually something that negotiates between the id and the superego. But the superego is like in placement of the ruh. And then you have the qalb, which is the ego. And then you have the desires, the nafs, which is the id. So he came pretty close in some aspects. He came close in many other aspects too. Well, this was kind of like that. When I first saw this chart, I wasn't very impressed. Uh, but as I got deeper into thinking about these issues, I started to realize, no, there is some truth to this, not necessarily in the way that they put it. Like, for example, if somebody says, I believe evolution happened, uh, but if he believes it from an Islamic perspective, he may not believe in Darwinian evolution or in equilibrium, spontaneous equilibrium. He, he will believe that whatever the case is, that God had a hand. Um, <clears throat> in the same thing here, that... Uh, so what are these three uh, states that when we're interacting with one another, we're going to interact in one of the three basic ways? You could say this is a good map to have to judge yourself. So one is to have a parental state, which is you have a, you have a state where you're telling your spouse, you're judging your spouse, you're telling your spouse what to do, how things should be, and uh you know, you uh, are in a state of monitoring. Sometimes you're critical 
in terms of parenting. Sometimes you're nurturing in terms of parenting. Then the second state is like an adult. This is where we want people to be, right? Uh, and I'll talk about adult later, but let me talk about the child. The child state is when you, um, you could say you develop response to rules because of your upbringing, as a result of your upbringing. So you, uh, may respond to things in a, in a, in a way that, uh, and I'll give you some examples where you lash out a lot more like a child. So that's a child state, child like state when you're lashing out, when you're judging others, that's more like a parental state, right? But then there are two types of parents. There are parents that are critical, parents that are nurturing. And then the middle one is where, uh, if you read this, the planner, observer, organizer, analyzer, the part of the self that can think logically and rationally and act accordingly. Uh, more importantly, the adult is concerned with the here and the now. The adult uh, is not influenced necessarily as much by his or her past. So now when the husband makes a request, can you do this? Um, so what happens as a result? The um, <clears throat> what will happen as a result is hold on one second. Okay. So we'll look at a few examples. Um, but keep this picture in mind. So now let's look at another aspect, okay? How a person will respond uh, if the parent was critical uh, or if the parent was nurturing, uh, the, the person will learn to respond from childhood uh, from that perspective. So if the parent was critical and the child begins to think I'm a loser, right? Because every time I did anything, my parent, my mom was always critical of me. Every time I did anything, my parents were critical of me. They were never appreciative. They never appreciated me. So now when he's in marriage or she's in marriage and the spouse is being critical, they're going to, they're going to respond like, and if, if in this case, let's say the husband is parental in his stature. Now, one thing that's very important to know is that it's very interesting to know this. This is like throughout the whole field of psychology, which is that there's always one person more dominant than the other in any given relationship. There's no such thing as a 100% equal relationship. There's no such thing. Uh, there's, you know, even in people that do crimes, uh, for example, there's two people doing crimes. There will always be uh, one suspect that's the dominant character in it and one person that is the more uh he's following orders not to say that that's the only dynamic that's not to say that's the only dynamic but that is one way to look at it so now uh we learn to how we respond to bids requests somebody says uh i'll give you an example that the person who actually came out with this idea he gives a few examples but one of his examples is uh the husband says let's go to the movies uh, and uh the wife says and 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 she says uh well uh don't we have to save money to paint the house for example right so the they they respond to one another based upon their upbringing and pre-established uh, sets, their experience basically. And the childhood experience is very, very important because you have parents that are huge and children that are small. So the psychological impact is pretty strong. Um, okay. <clears throat> so parent, what is a parent type attitude within a relationship? Controlling, authoritarian, although it may be well-meaning as well as critical. So, you know, that's the parent. Uh, adult is where we're saying you need to be realistic, balanced, logical way of interacting with others, which most people consider desirable. 
Child occurs when the person is thinking and feeling like a child, being helpless, rebellious, and conforming. So if a person feels, if he grew up feeling, I have to always conform to what other people say. I have to always conform to whatever my boss says. I have to always do whatever my boss says. And you resent that, you're going to lash out like a child, more likely, right? So whatever you grew up with is then, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't develop and get into the adult phase where, or if you're in the parental phase, so you're going to adapt one of the two ways as you're growing up, either you're going to become like a child and, or you're going to become like an adult. And what's happening by the way, is that girls are becoming more parental, the wives and the guys are becoming more childlike. This is what's happening as in the last 20 years, as we're growing up. The, the, the men have the excuses and the, the girls are on the edge and they're trying to, you know, uh, they're living on the edge and they're very, uh, instead of being like in the middle, which is like an adult. Now, there's a lot more to this, but I'm just trying to give it to you in a way that, um, so again, this is no state of mind is good or bad per se. Uh, one thing that I do want to say is, um, I'll, I'll give the t-shirt example. You've all seen a t-shirt with some statement in the front and another statement in the back, right? So this is what's happening with every bid, every transaction, every request. The wife says, can you do the dishes? And the husband's going to say something in, in the front, but behind it, there's a whole his your whole history, your whole life that drives whatever the husband may say as a result okay so for example in the front very very typical um example you this is like patterns that you see in couples over and over again they're about qu quite a few famous ones some uh, anywhere from depending upon how what you consider a pattern anywhere from eight to 20 patterns one of the most well-known patterns uh, actually, some would say the most well-known pattern of behavior between husband and wife is it's because of you or it's your fault, right? Uh, but behind, so I'll give you a typical textbook example. Um, uh, the, the husband says to the wife, why don't you learn to drive? And the wife blames the husband. It's because you, of you, I'm not learning to drive. And, but in the back of her mind, she feels she would fail the exam anyway, or that there's no way she can learn to drive. So there's this, so what happens as a result of this, you can say this dynamic, the parent, the adult, the child, you'll see what happens as a result of this, which is important. This picture that you see here, the parent, adult, and child, this took me a long time to understand that, <laughs> Because it's not even about being, uh, or it's not even about how you grew up, it's how you learn to cope. So you either cope in a parental way, or you either cope in a child way. Because that's all we know as human beings. All we know is either you can be like parents, or you can be like children. And so you adapt. And very few get into the middle, where it's more like an adult. And so when ha problems happen, is when somebody is talking to you like a parent and you get a response like a child, like when there's a crisscross, cross, we call it, a crisscross. So if you, there's an adult talking to an adult and they're talking to each other like adults, that's no issue. Uh, if a parent is talking to another person who has a parental attitude, but they're expecting a parental attitude, everything will be fine. If somebody's talking to an adult to an adult in their inner state, and everything is going as a conversation of an adult to an adult, everything will be fine. A child to a child uh, will be fine. It's only when somebody's being judgmental and then somebody responds as an adult, or if somebody's being a parent and then somebody responds as a child, that's where the problems come in. So, whenever you're in a conflict, you have to sit down and ask yourself, okay, where is the crisscross? Uh, who was being judgmental? Who am I responding to? And how am I responding, right? So if you're a parent, uh, so, so let's just look at this further. 
Uh, let's see if I can show you this. So crossed transactions. Before we go there, let me just uh, give you some examples. Person A, it's a lovely weather for this time of the year. Person B, yes, isn't it nice to see the sun? The conversation is equal. There's no judgment. It's just an adult conversation. It's just like when you go to the office, you say to somebody, hi. He says, hi back, right? These are all uh, what some people call strokes, like equal to equal. Uh, you get to know the person in the office and he says, hi, you say hi, and you um, learned that he knows a lot about cars. You might start asking about, there's, there's no emotional element to it. There's no conflict to it, right? uh child to parent oh i've cut myself parent says oh dear come here let me clean it up for you so that's the nurturing parent um let's look at some more examples uh an adult to an adult have you written the report yes i'm about to email it to you okay no problem we'll look at another example that's similar to that child to child uh let's just uh uh, would you like to skip this meeting and go watch a film instead? Or this is when a teenager in school will say, let's skip class. He says this to another teenager. I'd love to. I don't want to be in class anyway. So what should we go and do? So equal to equal response, because there's nothing emotional about it. It's just very normal tr human transactions. Now let's look at the crisscrossed uh, response. So an adult type behavior will say, uh, can I tell you, uh, can you tell me what time it is? Uh, the adopted adult, adult child will say, or th the childlike state of mind will say, why are you always rushing me? Right? So what's happening here? He's on the literary aspect. He's not even saying anything about rushing. He's saying, can you tell me what time it is? But the child reads into the conversation to understand the conversation. What it really means is he's trying to, or the adult is trying to tell me we're running late. And that is what the person is responding to. So one thing to consider is, are you talking to each other as adult to adult or as a parental, judgmental, or as a child, are you lashing out? And the second thing to look at is that when you are talking to each other, are you reading into what is being said. Now, one of the ways that you know that it's a child is the child is not answering the question or dealing with the question at hand, but lashing out based upon a certain assumption. Uh, <clears throat> can you tell me uh, what time it is? You all, you're always late anyway. What do you care? So this is like, you know, uh, if uh, my wife says, tell me what time it is. And Ibrahim says to mommy, you're late anyways, what does it matter, right? So this is, but then this can happen between adults. It's not a matter of age. So if my wife says to me what time it is, I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter. We're late always anyways, okay? So what's going on there is uh, that somebody's asking a very general neutral question, but the response is critical. Right. So like a parent, parental response. Uh, have you written that report? Will you stop uh, harassing me? I'll do it eventually. So this could be like two adults. Um, and if you don't change your ad attitude, I'll get you fired. So the person A responds that way. Uh, is your room tidy yet? Uh, let's say the wife asks the, uh, the husband and I'm just going to do it actually. So that's his response. <laughs> uh, he wrote here very interestingly enough, this is a more positive cross transaction. There is, however, the risk that A will feel that B is acting responsibly and not playing their expected role. And the conversation will develop into, I can never trust you to do things. Why don't you believe anything I say? The husband responds back. So you all get the point. So the point is, that which state of mind are you responding to one another, okay? So just one more time, just reviewing this, uh, parent's state of ego, behaviors, thoughts, feelings copied from parents 
or parental figures from the past, um, basically being judgmental, okay? Ego state, thoughts, behavior, feelings, which are a response to the here and the now. I like that much better. Child, behaviors and thoughts, feelings. So this is more, the child is more at the feeling level. Well, here's the contradiction based upon everything we've been reading. We ask people to validate us, which has to do with feelings. But then we're also saying feelings is sometimes a childlike state. So we're going to resolve this as we go for, forward. Another aspect of this is uh, what can be called the drama triangle. That uh, somebody in the relationship is going to be the rescuer, persecutor, or the victim based upon the conversation. Are you the victim? Do you feel like you're the victim? Do you feel like you're the victim because you are the victim? Or do you feel like you're a victim because that's what you've told yourself over many, many years? Do you feel like you're the rescuer? You have to always come to the rescue of the family. Like I have to do this and I have to do this for this and I have to, I have to rescue. If, it wasn't, if it's not for me, everything will fall apart, right? Persecutor, it's your fault. So persecutor and victim, are playing two sides of the same coin. And then the rescuer is the chronic pleaser sometimes. So let me help you. Uh, it's always your fault. And poor me, I'm, I've been victimized. Poor me, my parents always this, or uh, it's your fault, right? Uh, let me help you. Now you'll see the other side of this, which I'll show you here, where conversations should be. Uh, most of the conversations we even see on TV, I was going to play some conversations today, but I couldn't find any video that had clean words in it. Because when they show on videos husbands and wives fighting, they think it's necessary to add bad language to it. So <clears throat> persecutor, rescuer, victim. That's one part of the triangle, you can say. The other is, on the more positive side, is instead of the rescuer, that person's coaching the person. It's more like a coach. Instead of being the persecutor, you're challenging the person. Instead of being a victim, you're like, okay, what are the solutions? What solution can we have? So when you're talking to each other, where are you on this scale, right? And so you have this scale to look at, you have the par parental adult child scale to look at. And when any request is made, how are you responding to it? And this is very, very important that you're able to, because the change, you know, people think that you're going to sit with a counselor and he's going to solve the marriage problem. It doesn't work like that. The marriage counselor can only, the change comes from the individual, right? So one of the two has to change something, at least for, for things to move forward. So if both of them don't change, one of them has to change. So we're going to look at things first from the perspective of the one person who has to change. Uh, okay. Um, let's just continue from here quickly. So uh, controlling parents and uh, critical versus structured. There's some parents, they like to give structure. Uh and other parents, they're on the critical side. That's the negative side of control. The positive side of control is to give structure. So structure and nurturing together, that balance is really like the best uh, combination. So you have criti critical on the one side and smothering. Now, what many parents do is they're extremely critical and then they throw love bombs on their children. So... And then that affects how they grow up because now they're they're not able to react to their parents, but they're definitely going to react to their boss, to their spouse, to other people in their lives. And so there's structured control and then there's nurturing uh, and then there's nurturing. The opposite of nurturing is smothering. You just give them, you spoil them like brats, right? So the worst combination is where you're critical and then because you feel guilty, you're critical, you're also smothering. That's like the worst combination. Now, you may grow up being a parental person who is also critical and smothering, who now you're critical of your spouse and then you show love to your spouse and then critical to your spouse and show love to your spouse. And a lot of people fall in this 
category. <clears throat> the adult, on the other hand, is the one who is looking at, okay, response and choice. What, res what is the reasonable response? What are our choices? What are our options? They're not going too much into history. They're in the here and the now. What do I need to do? Another person grows up as a child uh, on the positive side, adopted. If you, uh, you're, a, 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 you're, you're reasonably able to work with other people, you're cooperative, uh, you're spontaneous, you're free, is the other side. That's the positive. The negative is rebellious and destructive. So let me put it this way. If you grow your child at the level of critical and smothering, then there is the, the, the long-term response you can expect is rebellious and destructive. Okay. If, uh, if you have structured and nurturing and you have a good balance between the two, then you can expect the child to be the child to be cooperative and spontaneous. Okay, or the the child will grow up to be just like the parent, or the or the child will grow up to be critical and smothering, or the child will grow up to be rebellious and destructive. But either way, no matter the default is to either become like your parent, or to continue as a child of uh, in a childlike state of your parent. But what needs to happen is you need to move to the middle to the adult to the here and the now, to not be a, reading into language based upon your past. So that's one of the things. Uh, I won't talk about this right now. Uh, we'll talk about this later. <clears throat> okay, where to start? If you want to improve your relationship, then you begin by changing the relationship in your head. So this is the most important thing to understand where a relationship changes. You don't have control of your spouse's mind, but you have control of your own mind. So if you want to improve your relationship, and I just want to, in terms of being an adult uh, in a relationship, I wanted to share these verses of Quran with you, and uh, we'll see how far this goes and how, how well this goes, inshallah. Um, but let's see how much time we have. I have about 20 minutes. So let's see if we can do this. And then, because I want to make a whole point. So we've talked about the bidding process. We, we've talked now about the three states of the ego based upon your past and where you should be. And we've talked about being a victim, a persecutor, or if you're going to be the rescuer. Okay. So now what I want to show you is that the Quran tends to talk about things from an emergency or from a drastic point of view. I'll give you an example. Meaning the Quran gives you a rule based upon a certain level of extreme sometimes. So for example, the Quran says don't eat pork, except if you do, then this is the way to do it. So the example of eating pork is like a very extreme example. Like it's, very, it's not really very often something like that will occur. For sure, if Quran mentioned it, it will occur. But it's not very often something like that will occur. So the same thing when Quran is talking about divorce. Now, we know that the conflict is at its highest. People are most in their fear state, survival state, childlike state when they're going through divorce, right? So we've all seen that through our friends and family members is that we always assume the worst. We're in survival mode. And so now regarding divorce, I want to specifically look at it from a transactional uh, perspective, okay? So I'm just gonna do the translation and let you all just get like the feeling the Quran is giving as I try to explain parts of it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, rajim, talaq maratan, talaq is twice. Then after that, you have to make a choice. فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ أَوْ تَصْرِيهُمْ بِالْإِحْسَانِ you either keep them in a good way or you let them go in a with ihsan with in a beautiful way sometimes that's very hard to do la yuhillu lakum an ta'khudhu mimma ataytumuhunna shay'an it is not halal for you that you take 
uh, that you take from them what you ever gave to them, anything of it, illa except and you have, except you both fear. If you both fear that you will not be able to keep the, the, the limits set by Allah, then the rules can change. But the main thing here, you'll see over and over again, uh, is this word, Hadudullah, the limits of Allah, which, are, which is what? Don't get too angry with each other. Don't backbite each other. Don't you know, break the rules of marriage or talaq in this case. Don't... Uh, trampled upon each other's rights so you'll see this right so you in a divorce state it's very hard to be in an adult state of ego and if you fear you cannot keep the hadud of allah then there's no harm upon both of them if the girl ransoms herself she says to her husband look let me go and you can keep my dowry for example okay Again, tilka hadudullah, these are the limits of Allah, fala ta'atuduha, don't cross them. Wa man yata'adda hadudullah, and whoever crosses the, 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 the hadud of Allah, the limits set by Allah, fa ulaika humud valimun, they are the ones that are wrongdoers. Wa in talakaha, and if you do talak of her for the third time, fala yuhilla lahu min ba'di hatta yankah zawjan ghayrah. Then she's not, you cannot marry her again until she marries another person. I'm not going into the details of this, of why and all that. I want to only talk about the character of the person, even in a time of divorce. So you'll see where this comes in. It's already, you can see parts of it now, but it'll become more clear as we go further, inshallah. So if uh, he uh, divorces her, then there's uh, nothing wrong with him taking her back, meaning after she marries the other man, and if they want to both go back, no one should stop them from coming back together. In dhanna, if they think, that they think that they can keep the limits of Allah. Again, that's that character, right? So you're in the marriage, you have a certain character. Tilka hadudullah, this is the limit set by Allah. Yubayyunuha liqawmi ya'lamun. This is Allah is making it clear so if people will come to know. Wa in talaktumun nisa. And when you do divorce them for the third time and you have decided to release them, fabalagna ajalahunna. And they have come to their term, their third menaces is close. Then you keep them in goodness or you let them go in goodness. And don't keep them to hurt them. And that state where, uh, so, so, you know, somebody will say, no, I want you as my wife, only that he can now hurt her because of the divorce situation. Whoever does that, he is wronged himself. Don't make a joke out of the signs of Allah, out of the commandments of Allah. You're using the commandment. No, it's my right to take you back, but then he's hurting her. And remember the favor of Allah upon you. And whatever Allah has sent down of the book and hikmah, wisdom, why you are why you and Allah warns you regarding this. Wattakullah, fear Allah. Allah and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly has knowledge of absolutely everything. And if you do give them final divorce, and they have reached their ajal, uh, they have reached their appointed time to now separate. In بينهم بالمعروف. So, then do not prevent them to marry their husbands, meaning their future husbands, because they're not husbands yet. Don't prevent them from marrying their husbands. If they have both agreed. Now, this has two meanings. 
One is if she got divorced from the second husband. One is if she got divorced from the first husband. I'm not going to the fiqhi aspects of this. This is the warning of Allah for those of you who believe in Allah in the day of judgment. This is better for you and more pure. Allah knows and you don't know. Now, this is actually the ayah that I wanted to share with you. That even when the divorce comes, the type of uh, attitude, forget about inside the marriage, but the attitude even outside the marriage. And the mothers, they will wean their children for two years complete. For whoever chooses that they want to wean their child. And on the father is the rizq and the clothing, the providence and the clothing of the child in ma'roof, meaning whatever is acceptable. And no one should be put in a burden more than they can bear. And the, the mother should not be hurt because of her uh, uh, child. Okay, and uh, and nor the father should be harmed because of his child. Now, if you took look at divorce cases today, this is like so relevant. All of those issues of children, of money, how much, all these things are discussed in one ayah. And on their on their, uh, their uh, warith, meaning the grandparents. And as you know, many times grandparents are given the custody. And the same thing for the people that are the that are inheritors of the child, the grandparents, meaning. And if they, if they do decide together, meaning the divorced husband and the divorced wife, if they both decide to wean the child, with the, with the happiness and contentment and agreement of both minhuma, and by the, the shura of both of them, then there's nothing wrong. And if you both decide that you want to have the child weaned by another person, then there's nothing wrong in doing so as long as uh, you, you, you hire the nursing lady, okay? And you give the money for it. Fear Allah. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full uh, insight into what you're doing. <coughs> Okay, so we'll just leave it till here. So what was the point that I was trying to make here? I was trying to make the point of the type of, you know, this is not a judgmental relationship, even at the time of divorce. This is not lashing out type of relationship, even at the time of divorce. It's a very adult-like relationship, even at the time of divorce. And be with your wives in a good way. So now, what both sides have to do is they have to think to themselves, okay, am I lashing out? Am I being judgmental? I can only change myself. So in a relationship, you can only change one person, okay? And that is yourself. So if you want to improve your relationship, then you begin by changing the relationship in your head. If you want to improve your relationship, then you begin by changing the relationship in your head. I already said this. Truth. Okay, yeah, and then <coughs> again, remember what I said about building a case, and uh, we'll come back to that at another point. What if, what if you looked at him or her through the lens of empathy or passion or compassion? How could you view their actions in a different way? So you have to ask yourself, okay, what ego state am I in? A child, a parent, an adult. What can I change in myself? So this gives you like a type of measurement of how to interact. How could you view their actions in a different way? Meaning positively, right? What if you were to give them the benefit of the doubt and find some positive <coughs> explanations for why they're behaving the way as they are? 
what to do, what do you want this relationship to be like? So these are some things to question. Like, what are my deal breakers in a relationship? Uh, what are things that, uh, how about if you go about creating that in your head? Okay, uh, what would I like this relationship to be like? <coughs> Can I change my expectations? Uh, what would you say or do? To change the unchangeable in a relationship, you have to change the relationship in your head. It has to start with you. <coughs> so it always starts like this in the beginning of a relationship. I've never met a person in my life that made me feel so happy and comfortable to be around. This is how, this is the uh, example of the enchantment phase. The same person, just different mindset, no filters. Remember, we talked about filters last time. No building cases, no hesitation in the bidding process. So these are kind of things we've already discussed. The person is the same, just a different mindset in, the, in this case, right? That uh, because you haven't built a case against them, because you don't have uh, filters yet to filter out and have a history with them, I've never met a person like this in my life. They make me feel so good. And then uh, in love feelings you experienced during the enchantment phase of your relationship were rather effortless, right? So in the beginning, uh, having trust and letting things go is very effortless. But a more mature love requires time and shared experiences and even hardship. That's just the nature of the game. There's no way around it. That uh, as the as the as you get to know each other, and as you're trying to improve yourselves, and as you're trying to do a bidding process that sometimes ends up being negative and negative and negative, you're requesting something but you're not able to get it get what you're requesting. Uh, a more mature love requires time and shared experiences and even hardship. Self-responsibility means that you, not your spouse, are responsible for your happiness, self-esteem, and success. This is very important to know. We think that our spouse will be the one that makes us happy. Yeah, in the beginning, it is like that with all the dopamines and everything or oxytonins, but it's not how reality is. Reality is that I'm responsible for how I feel, and my wife is responsible for how she feels. And uh, we have to only decide if this relationship is toxic or not. Otherwise, we have to learn to get along. But this also means be there for yourself. Meaning, if you put your, if you, if you, if your expectations are not being met, you have to put yourself first. You have to have your own back, take care, good care of yourself. And the most important thing is that while you're building the relationship up, communicate clearly what you need and want. Now, I'll tell you how many times <clears throat> I've talked to couples and uh, one of the spouses will give me a whole rundown of everything that they've done and, and everything that they've tried and everything that, you know, that, uh, that they've done. And I ask one simple question that what you're telling me, did you tell your spouse? And more than 90% of the time, guess what the answer is? No, I really haven't said it to him or her in that way. Well, that's exactly the problem. We, we avoid conflict and therefore we never say what we really are thinking. And because we never say what we're really thinking, we never get anything resolved. And we find ourselves in a vicious cycle because we're not clearly saying really what we want and why we want. And to know what you really want, you have to first know what state are you in? Are you, act, are you in your child state, an adult state? Are you in your parental state? Which state are you coming from, right? Are you seeing yourself as a victim? Are you the pros prosecutor? Are you seeing yourself as the rescuer? I'm always the one that's doing everything. You have to know yourself and then you have to be able to communicate where you, what you feel and what you need. Relationship is primarily about getting your needs met. So ask yourself, did I properly communicate? 
Now, a lot of people will say the most typical response to someone saying you have to communicate, they can't read your mind, they can't tell what you're thinking, is if my spouse really loves me, she would know what I need and give what I need. And this is completely not true unless the person is super already in a good relationship. If you're already in a good relationship, even then this is hard. This is something the prophet could do, but it's very hard in many cases. If my spouse really loves me, she would know what I need and give me what I need. It doesn't work like that. You have to, if you have needs, you have to know your needs. And once you know your needs, you have to have your needs properly communicated to your spouse. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. You see this clean garage? I did this yesterday. Do you believe me? No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I didn't do it. But the person who did this, the person who did this, he wanted to show off to his wife that look at what I did. Okay, now you can imagine the effort he put in to do this. But when he comes and shows his wife, she had other things in her mind. And she said, oh, okay, that's great. And she just left. Now, he started to feel bad about himself, but he was a smart guy because you know why? Not like that other story I told you last week where they went on a hike and they came back and the wife was sleeping and so on and so forth. And then she was yelling at them. Why didn't you put all the sleeping bags and everything back to in its proper place? But what happened here is the guy's like, no, I need my wife to acknowledge I did hard work here. So what does he do? He tells his wife, it, I need you to acknowledge I did a good job. And then she realizes, okay, he really needs that. And he, she acknowledges, yes. Now, I'm not saying you have to get to that level of nitty gritty. But if you feel that something is your need, you need to say it. And so that's the main point. Okay, so <clears throat> I've spent my entire morning working on this garage, and I'm feeling really proud of what I've done. I don't really like that attitude, but it's fine. I need you to tell me in no uncertain terms that it looks really, really good. Can you do that? Well, that's if she agrees, right? Asked very directly for what I felt I needed. And that is what couples stop doing. And the, the thing is, you must never stop doing that. Either you don't ask, and that's your personality. You don't ask because you're not going to do something unless Allah allows it, and you're fine with that. But if you're the type that needs validation or needs something or needs some need met, you must ask for it. Okay? What if the spouse cannot give validation? The Islamic way is to say alhamdulillah, right? Versus what uh, this person is saying. But alhamdulillah is a good way to go. But maybe you still need validation from your spouse or whatever need you have. Remember, relationship is about having your needs met. So I could have said, uh, I don't like this one either. So let's let this one go either. Okay. People think that it doesn't count if you have to ask for what you need. It's the same thing. It doesn't count unless the person already knows if they really love me. People, uh, people think it doesn't count if you ask then it, uh, for what you need, then it doesn't count. If you look at the uh, discussions of the companions of the prophet, if you look at uh, the discussions of the tabarin, if you look at the discussions of the taba tabarin, they always clearly spelled out, this is what I need, right? I need Jannah, for example. I need Jannah. So that's a need. I need that. So you clearly state that. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just see how much time I have. So, okay. It's okay to be clear and explicit. I need a hug. I like a little private time. I'm hoping we can have some couple time this weekend. I'm the, in the mood for affection. Whatever your needs are, that's why you are in the marriage. 
being aware of your needs and communicating them does not always mean your partner will give you what you need. That also is a fact. Just because you communicated them does not mean that you have to have the expectation that those needs will be met. But it's very important for you to know yourself and to know your needs and to be able to communicate that so that a higher percentage of your needs are met rather than, well, I'm not going to say it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have any effect. No, you should always say it. You should always have a conversation and you should always make it clear because you'll see why. Because it, this is a process that is going to either put you in a vicious cycle or there's only one way to come out of it. And we're going to be discussing that as time goes by. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so we'll maybe talk about this uh, next time. Uh, I will, no, I don't want to do this right now. I want you to look at these pictures. I wanted to do this exercise before I left. See yourself in these pictures. So identify next time with your state more easily and quickly. So this is just to like uh, help create a type of association. I know we're not going to like do a whole counseling thing on it, but just kind of like, get an idea of seeing yourself in that state, right? So this is when people are arguing and they're not even aware, they're, they're not communicating their needs, are they? They're just like arguing. And usually when they're arguing, they're not even arguing over what they actually need. The argument then goes on to other things that have, that are there, but they're less about the need. So I just put these pictures up for, people to kind of like see the physical response to the emotional state. Uh, okay, I will mention this point number one. Uh, I think I'll talk about it next time maybe uh, from here. Uh, actually from... Okay, so one of the major things I want you to understand from this, now that we've talked about this, uh, when we're looking at the parent, adult, and child, you should be able to easily understand from here that the way somebody responds to you has very little to do with you and is more about them. Do you see that? Because the way they respond to you, whether they're responding to a bidding you have, your, you have a request to your husband or to your wife, the way they respond to you has more to do with how they are feeling and how they feel about themselves more often than how they feel about you. Yes, sometimes it is about how they feel about you, but very often it is about how they feel about themselves. And so we become upset because even though the person's responding to you based upon how they are feeling, we, 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 we take offense to it as if it's about us and not them. Whereas for them, it's about them. And we read it as, remember what we talked about the filter. Uh, if you remember, I'll show you very quickly that picture again. So it comes to your mind. Okay. <clears throat> what you are saying is not the same as what's being received. Okay. The communication goes through a filter. And that filter has everything to do with if you are in the parent state, a child state, or in an adult state. Everything that they're saying, what you say and what they hear, there's always, always, always going to be a gap. The only person who was the perfect communicator was Prophet Muhammad. He, that was his job, literally. Right? Balahu Mubin. So... He was the perfect communicator. But otherwise, every human being, what you say to your wife is not what she's hearing. There's always going to be a gap. And so the sender, and, the, and what's this filter? Of course, the words, of course, the body language, of course, the tone, all that matters. But what matters in terms of your history and your experience is, are you in a childlike state? Are, are you in an adult-like state? Uh, are your needs being met? This is going to be a big question. Can I trust this person or not trust this person? So every, everything that's being sent, said is going through a filter. And so 
the first thing a person has to do again is this. If you want to improve your relationship, if you want to improve your relationship with your spouse, then you begin by changing the relationship in your head. That's what, because why? Changing it in your head means you improve the filter by which you're understanding what they're saying. And so you have to change that filter. So how can you do that? Well, there are exercises husbands and wives can do together, which I'll be talking about soon. There are uh, things husbands and wives can do together, which I'll be talking about soon, that will help transition the mindset of the husband and the wife regarding both of them. So if you want to improve your relationship, you have to change it in your head. You have to change the filter, uh, the ego state at which you are talking to each other with. Um, so I think I'll end it with that for now. Um, <clears throat> if anyone has any specific questions, I'll answer one or two questions uh, and then we'll call it a day. The only person who cannot ask me a question is not here anyway. Okay. So if there's one or two questions, I'll take them. Can what? Uh, repeat that, please. Yeah, 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 inshallah, I'll send that. That one slide with the two circles before, like the plus minus, plus minus. Okay, yes. So, this thing, do you, as a team, parents can be like one person in front of a one person smothering? Yes, exactly. And then it can result in rebellious and uh, destructive. That's right. Or it could be one parent. Doing both. Well, if it was the way you're saying, yes, yes. Yeah, so you'll get something maybe in the middle or whoever the child is closer to. It it all it it's all a dice throw of the dice to tell you the truth. There's no real way to tell, but there is certain patterns we see for sure. So, for example, if you look at children that are rebellious and destructive, you'll always find, for example, yes, exactly. They're smothered and being judged upon. So even though you cannot be 100% sure, but there is definitely a correlation. So, okay, the other question is regarding... And the only way to come out of that is to have shukr, because shukr allows you to look at even the worst situation in a good way. You're saying as the as the as the, as the child towards the parent. Yes, exactly. But this does not mean <coughs> so the communicating between you know we're talking about egos, parents ego, child ego, so child So these are these are what he he basically it's two adults, right? But they're either in a parent state, adult state, or a child state. And it could change. And even though you may be in one state most of the time, but you have other things too. Meaning you can sometimes be a child, you can sometimes be an adult, sometimes a parent. But when you're arguing, you'll tend to default to either parent or child. Uh, uh, so I guess I'm taking it back to not to... Right, you know, okay. Spousal relationships, but rather parental relationship with an adult child for example okay so there's if let's say there's a discussion between an adult parent and an adult child it should be adult to adult correct it shouldn't be we should try to avoid at some point when like having that parent to, to child so according to Ali radiallahu an, from the age 14 and onwards you have to shift to the adult to adult with your child. 
How do you, how do, you do that if the child is resulting to rebellious feelings? Even if it's a teen child, <coughs> like if they themselves, let's say you're trying to have an adult conversation with them or adult advice or trust, you know, discussion, and they result to rebellious feelings, and you go to the structures, and you just have to be transparent. No, uh, a few things. Number one, if they're going to be rebellious and destructive, then sometimes people learn. I mean, sometimes parents try everything not to do that. But the kid will still find their way to be rebellious and leave the house and do whatever they're going to do. And then they have to learn the hard way. They have to they have to get a little bit of the medicine of real life. But then the parents have to have the courage to give them what they're actually thinking that they want, but they don't want, which is like, okay, well, if you're going to be on your own, then be on your own. But I'm saying that that should come from that that should come from a structured atmosphere that they don't want to be in, and not necessarily critical and smart. Yes. Trying to stay structured and nurturing. Structured structure is very important for children, and nurturing is also very important for children. Children want structure, like there's a very good book on this. Um, I think it's called How to Talk to Children. Let's see if something comes up. Yes, this is the book. No. This is a really good book. This is the audio version of it. But uh, this book right here. <clears throat> so one of the things that they talk about in this book is the need for structure. So Islam gives us structure, like the five-time prayers, but it also gives us the nurturing aspect. All right. I'll, I'll that. Uh, how do you balance in relationships, especially you know, if each person is focusing on their own needs in terms of general concepts of, you know, being sorry and, and sacrifice? So, what's, what's the, the balance so if So the premises of it is that you can't, so we're not talking about doing good, right? We're starting off by talking about more about a state of conflict. That's what we're dealing with right now. So if there's a conflict, there's a bidding, the, the husband says, let's go to the movies. And the wife says, we still have to paint the house. We don't have money to go to the movies. I'm just giving a textbook example. So I'm talking about, in the moment of conflict. And so at that moment of conflict, you have to sit back and see, okay, what are my needs? What are really things I want in life? If the conflict is continuously and in a vicious cycle, uh, and what state of mind am I in uh, when I'm in that state of argument? Am I, am I judgmental or do I lash out like a child? Or am I thoughtful in the because if you're like an adult you'll be like okay what are our options but when you do each decision making is a conflict with your own needs versus other person's needs we're gonna get there sometimes yes sometimes no it doesn't need to be a bidding or it doesn't need to be sometimes the bidding can be a compromise like in, at work you need to do you know you just need to follow you may not like it if you don't do it you need to go <coughs> for example so but this is different the because the the relationship between the husband and wife is not institutionalized in the same way let's say a job right right but what i'm saying is in every way we follow this, these rules of decision making and they are probably most of the time you may not like it and that our needs are not so but what's the, the your job isn't 
there to help you meet your needs of being a human being. But your relationship is existing to meet your needs, your emotional, physical, emotional needs. It exists for that purpose. So the real problem isn't, the real problem happens when there's a conflict of needs, a conflict of decision or conflict of, I want this, but you want that. That's where the real, and, and really it happens when it's become a cycle over and over again. Can you again just repeat the purpose of a relationship? Because that was deep. The purpose of a relationship is to meet our needs as a human being. So you can add, you can say it's pies. What are our needs? Pies, physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and spiritual. No, can you say it again? Pies. Pies. I got pies. I need Physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and spiritual. Yeah, let me take, think about the social Can you say that the social system would say made to someone to meet his own needs? No, the question would be did they meet his needs? And did the Prophet meet their needs? So, you know, the question is, can we write a book showing how the Prophet met his wife's physical needs, their intellectual needs? Like Aisha became a scholar, emotional needs, their social needs, their spiritual needs. In terms of purpose of a relationship, what's the intention? Then? When a person's needs are fulfilled, then they're happy. It's like the baby wants milk. You give the baby milk, they'll be happy. But the only thing is, they have to complete your needs and you have to complete their needs. But the problem is, when the filter comes in, you're building a case against your spouse and you don't trust them and you don't feel they care for you, then you begin to back off from fulfilling their needs and they back off from fulfilling your needs. This is why I said, actually, the most important thing I think I said is that you have to clearly state what your needs are. Right? Because we give up on doing that. And we then tell ourselves that they should know what they have to do. Or they should know already what they have to do. No. If you feel they haven't done the guesswork, or if they can't guess it, you need to maybe say it. You need to say what needs need to be met. So even about argument, I'll say that there's arguments at two different levels. One is the argument in the moment. And we should have a rule, which I tell all couples to do this rule. I don't do it myself, but in therapy, I tell all the couples to do it. So I'll just put it out there in case uh, my wife says anything. <laughs> The rule that I tell all couples is that you have to have a timer that in the moment of the conflict, you have only five minutes to argue. So you can let out what you want to say, but then at night before you go to sleep is when you have the discussion, not argument, over what was bothering you. Chat, is there a question? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, I'm talking about marital relationships, but a lot of this can be applied to any relationship. Could you read the question? Uh, one question is, is it solely for uh, marital relationships or all relationships? All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yes, inshallah.